Let's have a word of prayer together, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, as we uh, wade into this topic, uh, this part of our presentation, we want to pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide, Lord, that you will be glorified, that your people will be helped, and that we'll know how to advance past some of the challenges that, that have come, some of the understandings that have come, and be right on track, Lord, so you can take us to the next level. Work with us, we pray. Send your Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So, Ellen White's Christology Demystified. Uh, we have some handouts for you uh, up here. We want to give those to you. And uh, the deacons are occupied right now, but as soon as they come uh, finish, they'll come back. And we have uh, three handouts for you. Uh, one handout is a two-page multicolor handout uh, focusing on certain paragraphs in the, uh, uh, in the Baker letter we're going to be talking about. Some ideas about the nature of Christ that have been turned kind of one way and another. Another document that you'll receive, uh, at least one per family, I would think, uh, is we have for you, numbered par by paragraph by the Ellen White Estate release, we have for you the entire Baker letter, all nine or ten pages of it. Uh, we have that for you so that if you've ever, ever wondered, you've heard about the Baker letter, you've heard about it, but you don't know what it is, or you've heard a, seen a quote from it, you'll have the whole thing from the first paragraph to the last. You can look at it, you can read it, you can study, and you can see what you think. So we'll have that for you as well. And then we have a, a third uh, two-page handout that has got some statements from the early church fathers on a teaching that is called adoptionism. So we're going to go ahead and over the next few minutes you'll be receiving those handouts. Uh, we could flash all this across to the screen for you and it would come and it would go when you'd go home and say, I remember that flashed on the screen. Um, in fact, I probably, probably should put it on the screen anyway, but uh, I'm giving you something, we're giving you something that you can also keep and uh, refer to for your own study. Well, I'd like to ask you to join me as we seek to accomplish the following. In this talk, we're going to survey the Adventist understanding of the nature of Christ from our beginnings until the 1950s. We're going to review best practices for interpreting Ellen White's writings. We're going to review the Bible teaching on the nature of Christ. We're going to consider Ellen White's main published statements on the nature of Christ. And then we're going, going to investigate her chief unpublished writing, the Baker Letter. And after we've worked through that and cleared the ground, I believe we'll be able to understand much more clearly Ellen White's view on the nature of Christ. So we're looking at, in this presentation, we're looking at this term, term you might have heard, Christology. Christology stands for what the inspired writings tell us about Jesus and the combination of his divinity with humanity. So this is a deep, crucial topic dealing with our own Savior. Well, from the earliest published statements of the Seventh-day Adventists until the publication 72 years later of Ellen White's private 1895 letter to W.L.H. Baker, which was published in 1957, until that time, the church presented a unified understanding on the nature of Christ. And evidence for this is abundant. We won't uh, plow into this too far, but uh, there are documents uh, available to you. The Word was made flesh by, uh, by uh, Ralph Larson. This goes through historically the first hundred years of Seventh-day Adventist teaching on Christology. Uh, this book kind of goes in and out of print at different times, but this is a really remarkable book. It's done chronologically, and uh, you can see for yourself what was published in our different publications down through the years. And so I would recommend that to you if you're interested in this topic. This book is a, a remarkable resource for you, one of the best. Another one, uh, this is uh, published on Review and Herald uh, a period of years ago, J.R. Zercher, Touched with Our Feelings. And uh, an interesting and important book uh, on the nature of Christ. It does a lot of the same uh, business going through the historical development, what was taught when, and so on. And it has a foreword by Kenneth H. Wood, uh, who was also involved in the time of the QOD uh, controversy. So touched with our feelings, and then many years later written by Zercher and with that. So these are very exceptional resources. Again, if they're out of print, you can get a lot of these things online uh, in a used fashion over the internet. So the church presented a, a very unified understanding on this topic 
And these two volumes uh, and your own personal study will, will very much sustain, I believe, that. That's not even really, not even really disputed hardly by, by hardly anybody. Until the publication of the Baker letter, the Adventist approach on the nature of Christ was actually very simple. It was to teach about the nature of Christ from Bible passages in Romans, Philippians, and Hebrews. None attempted to pose one set of Ellen White quotations against another. And that's a contemporary phenomenon. That was not the way things were done in the previous days. Before the 1950s, the view held by the Seventh-day Adventist Church was that Jesus took the nature of Adam after Adam had sinned. That is, that when Jesus came, he took an after-the-fall kind of humanity. He took a fallen nature like yours and mine. This is what Seventh-day Adventist Church taught uh, up until the 1950s, from the beginning all the way to the 1950s. In 1957, excerpts from White's, Ellen White's private 1895 letter were included in the back of Questions on Doctrine, and in, an, in a, something called Appendix B, which was titled Christ's Nature During the Incarnation. The appendix was a compilation of Ellen White quotations. Well, what could possibly go wrong with a compilation of Ellen White quotations? Well, it was arranged in a very misleading way. Headings were provided in some cases exactly contradicting what she'd written. Key statements were kept out of the compilation. Statements that were provided were italicized to support a preferred emphasis. It's okay to italicize things, but should say that you're doing it or, or try to be even-handed as you do it, but they did that. In some cases, there were ellipses. You know what ellipses are, those little three or four dot uh, bullet holes that you often find in an Ellen White quotation. Something uh, has been left aside, and uh, sometimes things are left aside, and that's just fine. Other times things are left aside that that really contradict the idea that, that that person who's quoting her wants to wants to have her say. So watch out for bullet holes. Uh, something's been skipped over like that sometimes. Material from the Baker letter was repeated multiple times in the back pages of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5. And you can see this if you uh, actually go and read there and study it. You'll see uh, certain lines appearing again and again and again as though Ellen White made the same statement many, many times when actually this is a lot of these come from the very same pages out of the Baker letter and they're just repeated in different uh, uh, slices, big slices and little slices, three or four times some of them, uh, which is again misleading, makes her look like she's saying something a little bit different. So these quotations presented in a false setting were made the basis for a modification of the Adventist view of Jesus' humanity. As Seventh-day Adventists, we're committed to the truth of God, aren't we? We want to know what saith the Word of God. What is the truth? Hey, if, if the Sabbath is on Wednesday, let's all become Wednesdayarians, right? It, it, whatever the teaching is, we want to follow it. Whatever the truth is, we want to follow it. So that's, that's a baseline for being a Seventh-day Adventist. Show me the truth. If it matches the Bible, I'm with you. I don't care what it costs. I will pay the price to follow Jesus. So where, whatever the truth is, wherever we find it, we want, however much we have to change our understanding to be faithful to God, we'll do it. Because we want to follow Jesus. On the other hand, if we find, uh, if we find error, so if we find something that we've been wrong about, but the Bible teaches it, we want to embrace it. But on the other hand, if we find something that, that we've, we've ch double check it, we've always taught it, we look at it, we say, oh, that really is right. We're teaching the right thing. Guess what? Then we want to be wholeheartedly in support of it. We want to go ahead and redouble our efforts and teach that truth all the way. Isn't that what being an Adventist is about? So that's where we are, I believe, on the nature of Christ. If we study it, if we study the full body of evidence in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, and we find them to confirm what we believe, then we should uh, continue to teach it. If we study those things and find out that we've been wrong or we're mistaken, we should regroup admit we were wrong, make an adjustment, and teach, teach the, the new way, which is more correct. Whichever way is, is sustained by the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, we want it. That's what we want to do is follow Jesus fully. That's part of being a Seventh-day Adventist. So that's kind of where we are. Uh, we have now a historical thing. We've taught this up to a certain period. Then there was a change in the 1950s, and we're just kind of on the same page here. We want to follow the truth, whatever it is. Now, let's move on to another area here and talk about Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is kind of a big troubling word, but it really just means different uh, important things involved in how we interpret inspired writings. 
And we all use hermeneutics, it's true. We use them uh, on our own all the time. And I'm going to share with you just very quickly about a half dozen important Bible rules of interpretation. And you will find these are also useful as we look at the writings of Ellen White. So let's just refresh our memory and look at these. I'll give you the six right now. Number one, gather up all the inspired data on a question and then consider the weight of evidence. Have you ever noticed that most passages usually aren't difficult to understand? Most things that the Bible says aren't difficult. But there will often appear to be a passage or a phrase that in certain respects it seems puzzling, seems like it contradicts or it's different from all the other ones that you've taken, uh, you've, you've gathered in your study. Do you know that if you often zero in and study closely, those one or two that seem like they're outlier passages, that seem like they don't match the others, once you begin studying them closely, you find that they are in full harmony with the other passages. You just had to look at them a little bit more carefully. So we, we uh, consider the weight of evidence and use that as a help in, in rightly interpreting uh, the Bible. Number two, determine the meaning of sentences and short quotations by carefully considering them in their context in the paragraphs and the longer passages where the author presented them. In other words, you don't just take a slice out and, and use that. You want to see what, okay, so here's an interesting sentence, but what is the paragraph that that sentence appears in? What is the, the two or three paragraphs? What is the chapter or book it appears in? See it in its context, then it'll help, help us understand whether it's right. So uh, we want to see it in its context, as both in its immediate context and then even more extended. How did, it, how did the author present it? How about number three? Let clearer passages guide in the interpretation of less clear passages. Isn't that a good principle? That's a serious Bible principle of interpretation. I'm not sh this is this one passage is a little bit difficult, but these are very clear. So guess what? We're going to again follow the weight of evidence. We're going to look for the clear passages and we're going to let those lead in our interpretation. Important principles of interpreting inspired writings. Number four, discover the author's intended meaning. How do we do that? The, the intended meaning must be the starting point by which we understand all, uh, all the things we're trying to understand. Generally speaking, we should be careful of novel interpretations that might occur to us that would never have occurred to the original authors in their setting. Okay, so we look again carefully. We look for the, try to understand what the author's intended meaning is. All right, number four. Number five, we look for the chair passages. The chair passages should lead in explanation. So chair comes from the idea of a teacher who's instructing students in the classroom, all right? So these are the particular passages that offer the most concentrated instruction on a given point. So the chair passage on the millennium is what in the Bible? If you want to, if you want to give a Bible study on the millennium, what passage will you use? Revelation chapter 20. The chair passage on the third angel's message in the Bible is what? Revelation 14. The chair passage on God's law would be what? There's, a, there's a several, but one we could go to would be Exodus 20, right? Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And so a chair passage on, on creation. Genesis chapter 1. See, we already use this principle, we just don't talk about it. Look for the most concentrated area where there's a teaching. So number five, we let the chair passages lead. And number six, we consider John Ray. We consider genre. Different kinds of inspired writings function differently. So there's narrative in the Bible, like Genesis. Those should be interpreted very literally. So when we see that it says that in six days, God creates the heavens and the earth in, in Genesis chapter one, we watch and we understand that those would be 24 uh, hour literal periods of days. But when we go to, to Daniel or Revelation and we see a day mentioned, those often, what, are the, what is the characteristic of Daniel and Revelation? Those apocalyptic books. Apocalyptic is a different genre. So ap apocalyptic is, has a lot of figures, a lot of symbols. So when we see a day mentioned in Revelation, we'll often find that we interpret uh, different prophecies or in the book of Daniel, 2300 days. We, we understand those to, to be symbolic of 2300 years. So we interpret, we look at the genre and that's an important thing in, in correctly interpreting. Each uh, thing is uh, interpreted according to the genre that the inspired writer chose for it. So to rightly divide the word of God is to interpret it according to the characteristics of the genre in which the inspired author provided it. So here's an example. I send a text message from my phone to my wife as I'm leaving the church board meeting. She texts back and she asks me to stop at the store and pick up some bananas. Does she include the address for our home in her text message to me? No. 
Now, maybe there's a day coming when that will happen, but, but, but we both know the address, okay? We both know the address. She doesn't need to include it. That shared information that she has, that I have, she doesn't have to put it in the text message. So uh, I already know where to deliver the groceries to. That's where I'm going. She and I both know where we live. We both understand that I'm already on my way home. This kind of communication, the kind of communication we're engaged in determines what's assumed and the kinds of details that are included in the message. So a text message is a kind of genre. It's a way of communication. Same principle is operative when we come to the Bible. In an epistle like 1 Corinthians, that's more like a cir circular letter than a personal letter. And so it's been carefully written for a broader audience. When, when Paul wrote that, he planned for it to be read in many churches, in many settings. He planned for it to be read widely. But the personal letter is a, a little bit different genre. The author and the recipient share in the context of the particular points. They share the context of particular points addressed in the letter. So, for example, the author of a personal letter in the Bible, like 3 John or Philemon, there's things that they are very directly known by the author and the recipient. And there might be more things that you and I don't know about because it's, they're leaving those things out. It's like a text message. Okay, They don't need to tell every piece of, of, the, of the information. So you have some things that have a lot of information, a circular letter or something written for wide publication. And you have some things that are going to leave out certain pieces of information, not because they're uninspired or anything. It's just because that's not needed in that in that kind of writing. And so the fact that the writer and the recipient share information in common with each other enables the writer to omit it, and they're still able to communicate well. The letter that Ellen White wrote to William Baker, the one that we just passed out to you, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, is part of this personal letter genre. It was written from Ellen White to this man uh, named Baker, and it was kept in the private files of the White Estate, this particular document, for 72 or 76 years. Uh, just laying there, it wasn't published, it was a private communication. Baker would, uh, because it was a personal letter to him, Baker would immediately understand well, Ellen White's references to things like propensities, to the writings of the early fathers. And, uh, but you and I, listening in from the outside, we may have to work a little bit harder to understand what Ellen White meant when she wrote these things, because we don't have some of that information that she had. And so, for example, in this Le Baker uh, document, which you'll see paragraphs numbered 18.1, 18.2, those different paragraph numbers. For example, paragraph 19.1, Ellen White says to Baker, the exact time when humanity blended with divinity, it is not necessary for us to know. Baker must have understood that. Ellen White certainly understood it. You and I, we're kind of uh, listening in from the side, and we might not understand the whole thing. We have to maybe be a little bit more careful in, in drawing conclusions and being careful in terms of making sure we're truly understanding what's going on, because it's a personal letter genre. While Ellen White was alive, you have to know that some people were gathering up rumors about what she said, rumors about that she'd said this or that she hadn't said that. And because of this confusion, Ellen White said something that was very useful and very important. She said this to the people, quote, if you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, and she's talking about herself, Sister White, if you desire to know what the Lord has written through, revealed through her, read her published works. So she says, don't worry about rumors and things. They may be correct, they may be incorrect. If you really want to know what I wrote, find my published writings and check those. Does that make sense? Ellen White, always, always practical down to the bone. And so here it is. That's 1888 materials, page 329 if you want it. Her published works were widely available and they were verifiable. You could see what Ellen White meant and what she said by, by what she wrote. Her published writings were carefully prepared. They were carefully prepared to be understood by the intended audience. They were edited and, and gone over carefully and sent out in wide distribution. The writings assumed only the degree of knowledge of Christianity which was common to the people in her time and place. And this is very fundamental to published writings. A published writing is going to include more detail so that the person who doesn't have the same context can understand it more readily. Another basic premise we hold, it's a very important premise, is that the content of White's writings in her private correspondence will be consistent with the content presented in her published writings. In other words, what she writes for, for uh, public reading and what she writes in a private letter are going to match. 
They're going to be consistent with each other. She's not going to teach Sabbath in one writing and teach Sunday in another. She's going to be consistent with herself. So we believe this very simple principle, and we kind of use it as a starting point, inspired writings agree with inspired writings. It sounds so obvious, it's almost silly to say it. And yet, it's not at all something that you can pass by, because today there's many people, many, who are of the belief and understanding that the Bible is not a consistent whole. Inspired writers do not necessarily agree with each other, and an inspired writer may not even agree with something that same person wrote in another time. That used to be a baseline presupposition in Protestant thought, but today, through higher critical things, developments, and so on, and understanding, you'll find that that's uh, you can't just assume that. So I'm just saying that as a beginning point. We agree, we begin at the point of saying inspired writings will agree with inspired writings. And then certainly Ellen White's writings will agree with Ellen White's writings. So, it's like rocket science here. But <laughs> All right. So let's talk for a minute about then, um, before we look at the Baker letter, let's refresh our understanding of what Scripture says about the humanity of Jesus. The Bible is abundant with content both implicit and explicit about Jesus in his humility and his close identification with fallen humanity. So, just a review of some of this because this all forms the background for the private letter. All right? So, what does the Bible teach? What did Ellen White talk about? What do you find when you read your Bible? Many, we'll just take a few pieces here. In Exodus 3, verse 2, Jesus presents himself as a lowly burning bush. In Exodus 21, 8, he is prefigured by a serpent on a pole. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses prophesies of Jesus as a prophet like himself who will rise from, from among human brothers. Psalm 8 describes man and his creation dignity, crowned by his creator with glory and honor. Hebrews 2 then takes that and shows the deeper reference to Jesus crowned with glory and honor a suffering and sympathizing man. In Isaiah 53, verse 2, Jesus is prophesied to come as a root out of dry ground. In the same chapter, verses 4 and 11, Jesus is wounded. He's wounded with our stripes, carries our griefs, sorrows and sicknesses, and the punishment he receives provides our healing. In the Gospels, Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man more than 80 times. This is his favorite nickname, the Son of Man. What kind of a man would that be? Well, all the sons of men who have ever been have had fallen natures. But the Gospels is really, again, only the beginning here. Romans 1.3 tells us that Jesus was the seed of David. And in chapter 8 of Romans, that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 13, another passage. Paul pleads there for readers to have the mind of Christ. He points points to Jesus emptying himself, coming in the likeness of men and keeping in the will of God while in human flesh. In Hebrews 2, 5 to 18, Jesus emphatically takes the same kind of humanity as all other fallen men as the seed of Abraham and is made like his brethren in all things. And over in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, Jesus is described by the inspired writer as tempted in all things as we are. The Bible evidence is substantial. It is emphatic and it is clear. Very much uh, material there we could wade into. Let's just take one quick sample uh, over in Hebrews chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, you can open to Hebrews 2. And again, we're going to uh, move straight through. But let's sample this. First seven chapters of, he chapters of Hebrews present Jesus as the ultimate revelation of God. The atonement's discussed there. Jesus is compared to Moses, angels, and to the, Levit Levit the Levitical priesthood. The necessity of diligence is repeatedly highlighted, but the most striking material closely connects Jesus' humanity with atonement and overcoming. So chapter 2, starting at verse 5, a little bit closer look. Jesus' mission of atonement is described, Hebrews 2, verse 5. Paul's writing about the world to come, earth and the future. This planet was placed in subjection to humans. The eighth psalm is cited describing the creation dignity of humans. Only a little lower than the angels, man was crowned with glory and honor, placed over the creation but all things are not subject to him yet. Our writer is referencing the sin problem, the rebellion of Lucifer, his enticement of man and man's subsequent fall. When Adam sinned, death was introduced. This is all Hebrews chapter 2. To restore his creation, Jesus comes in the same kind of damaged humanity and he tastes death for every man. He makes atonement. The humanity of those who need redemption and the humanity of the one who would redeem them is explicitly linked throughout the passage. See it. In verse 7 and in verse 9, verses 10 to 13, 
It's fitting for the Father in bringing many sons to glory to send Jesus to experience with humans the travails of humanity. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all from one, it says. From one what? From one common humanity. Jesus is not ashamed to call us fallen humans his brethren. Next, the author of Hebrews cites Psalm 22. This psalm foretells the sufferings of Jesus in his death on the cross. But there are two sections in this psalm. In the latter, he rejoices that his sacrifice has been accepted. The, the Bible particulars for sacrifice are carefully specified in Scripture. The sacrifice must be innocent and must be appropriate for the person offering. As a sacrifice for fallen humans, Jesus must bear our flesh in common with us. At the same time, he cannot sin. This exactly describes the sacrifice of Jesus, doesn't it? The next passage quoted in Hebrews 2 is drawn from Isaiah's chapter 8. Isaiah is describing his own mission where he says, that, when we go back to that and look at it in its context, he's describing his own mission where he says that he and his children were set to be signs and wonders from God in Israel. God gave them names prophetic in their significance. The author of Hebrews uses this connection of Isaiah and his children with Israel as a parallel for Jesus' connection with Israel. Jesus' work is a connecting work intimately linking God and humanity. At verse 14, now in Hebrews chapter 2, we see the necessity of Jesus, our high priest, sharing our kind of humanity. The Bible writer says, Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. It was necessary, you see, for Jesus to die in order to neutralize the power of Satan and to free us slaves of death. Here is subtle reference to Egypt, to Moses, and to Passover. Jesus is like Moses, delivering his people. At the same time, he is like the Passover sacrifice. But Jesus doesn't help angels. His humiliation takes him even lower than that. He helps the seed of Abraham. Again, the inspired writer emphasizes the necessity of Jesus being made like his brethren in all things. And again, the inspired writer didn't have to say in all things, but he does. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted, it says there. And in 4.15, Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses for the very reason that he has been tempted in all things as we are. It's actually rather straightforward. It reminds me of the things we heard this morning uh, from Elder Steed. Uh, there's so many things that the, the, the teaching of holiness in Scripture is so plain, it's so straightforward how could you really even almost even have an argument about it? And when we come to this topic of Christ's humanity, I really believe we'll find this coming in the same way. What can we say then? Hebrews 2 is certainly a seed of doctrine or a chair passage. In this passage, heaven reveals a lot to us about Jesus' humanity in relation to his making atonement for his people. And this is just a short sample. We could have looked at Philippians 2 or many other passages. Jesus, our great high priest, took a humanity like ours because that was the kind of humanity that needed redeeming. That's really not, again, it's not that complicated. Our kind of humanity, exactly our kind, that was the kind for which Jesus' example of overcoming is the most essential. Our Father gave him to us as the ultimate template example. Do you want to know how to live for God? Look to Jesus. How to overcome? Look to Jesus. How to advance in your walk with God? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So that's a little bit look again at the Bible, but then let's focus a little bit now uh, closer and look at Ellen White in particular. What was Ellen White's view on the nature of Christ? Well, again, Ellen White's view on the nature of Christ, the same as that of early Adventists, was fundamentally determined by and a continuation of the Bible teaching that we just reviewed. Okay, so the passages informing her were the same ones. Romans 8, Philippians 2, Hebrews 2, Hebrews 4. If we want to get Ellen White's understanding on the topic, we will need to follow the same hermeneutical plan that we use for Scripture. Namely, we look at all that she wrote touching the topic, and similarly, similarly to the Bible, it's given in various ways. Ellen White's writings on the nature of Christ come in different uh, kinds of writing. She prepares some material for wide publication and a general readership. Other times, she's writing a private letter to an individual dealing with particular points, especially known to her and the reader of her letter, but not necessarily known to us, since we lack that shared context and information that clarifies. Now, don't misunderstand, because we're, all of her writings we consider to be inspired. We're not taking anything away from that. 
At the same time, though, what we're doing is we have one group we call her published writings, and that's the group she pointed us to. If you want to understand my position on something, look at the, my published writings, she said. And there's another set of writings she wrote in the form of private uh, and unpublished letters. Uh, at least for a period of time, they're unpublished. Well, what about Ellen G. White's published statements? We find Ellen White's primary published content addressing the nature of Christ in a book that she wrote called, what's the answer? The Desire of Ages. The Desire of Ages. And uh, let me give you some examples. You already know them. But let's again see what she said in her published writings. Desire of Ages, page 49. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. On down the same page, 49, into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come to meet life's perils in common with every human soul, to fight the battles every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. Next quotation, extended quotation from Desire of Ages, page 117. Satan had pointed to Adam's sin as proof that God's law was unjust and could not be obeyed. In our humanity, Christ was to redeem Adam's failure. But when Adam was assailed by the tempter, none of the effects of sin were upon him. He stood in the strength of perfect manhood, possessing full vigor of mind and body. He was surrounded with the glories of Eden and was in daily communion with heavenly beings. It was not thus with Jesus when he entered the wilderness to cope with Satan. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. And Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. Many claim that it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. Then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained the victory that Adam failed to gain. If we have, in any sense, a more trying conflict than had Christ, then he would not be able to succor us, the succor us. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation, we have nothing to bear that he has not endured. A little bit further down the page, just where the ruin began, the work of our redemption must begin. As by the indulgence of appetite Adam fell, so by the denial of appetite Christ must overcome. And then before the page ends, again we're on 117, Desire of Ages. From the time of Adam to that of Christ, self-indulgence had increased the power of the appetites and passions until they had almost unlimited control. Thus men had become debased and diseased, and of themselves it was impossible for them to overcome. In man's behalf, Christ conquered by enduring the severest test. For our sake, he exercised a self-control stronger than hunger or death. And one more from Desire of Ages, page 336. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart, but he rested not in possession of almighty power. It was not as master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down, and he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care, that Jesus rested, and the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. Desire of Ages, and we could, give, uh, we could go on for quite some time giving Ellen White quotations on the nature of Christ, but I believe these paragraphs from her published writings, in her particular, her main published writing on this topic, Desire of Ages, distill the essence of Ellen White's rounded, carefully presented, inspired, intended for all readers, published presentation of her views on the nature of Christ. Clearer passages guide in the interpretation of less clear passages. Do you remember that principle? And so when we consider the things we've just heard and how clear they are, that's something to take into account as we're trying to understand what was Ellen White's uh, teaching on the nature of Christ. Clearer passages guide in the interpretation of less clear. Well, now think about what we've just heard. Notice Jesus accepted humanity after the race had been weakened for thousands of years. He fought the battle 
And again, as every child of humanity must fight it. You and I, by the way, are we not? We are part of every child of humanity. That includes us. That's our group. How must you and I fight the battle? In undamaged flesh or in damaged flesh? I know there's people here with glasses on, with uh, different amounts of hair on the head, and uh, various, there's probably somebody here with a knee replacement. There's various medical adjustments that have been made. We're not exactly uh, looking like a big group of winners here. We're 6,000 years down the line, and we have some, some damage and some, some decreases in our, our humanity from what it could be. In what kind of humanity was Jesus to redeem Adam's failure? Ellen White says, in our humanity. So God didn't throw us away. God says, I'm going to send my son in a kind of humanity that needs to be redeemed. And what, a, what an interesting group of people that need to be redeemed. We are. We're, we're kind of a troubled looking group. But Jesus took on him that kind of humanity, only that kind of humanity in which he could save man. And Ellen White uses this phraseology again, from the lowest depths of degradation. So again, that would include us, wouldn't it? No matter how low you think you've gone, the lowest is as low as you can go. And Jesus is ready to save you and I from the lowest depths, whatever our situation is. Quote, our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. And that's how far Jesus came for you and for I. He took humanity with every single liability there was. And he did that to save us. Ellen White again, we have nothing to bear that he has not endured. These are emphatic words. These are these absolute words, right? All and nothing. And these talk about Jesus, what he did for you, for you personally. Jesus conquered by enduring. She calls it not, you know, a pretty severe test, but she says the severest test. And I want to say to you that any of these, any of these statements tells us exactly what kind of humanity Jesus took. Any of them. We could stop right here. These are her pub published statements, her most careful for broad readership presented material. And it's not so complicated, is it? But let's move on. We're kind of zeroing in the Bible, then Ellen White's published statements. And now I'd like to talk to you about Ellen White's unpublished statements. And because of time, I'm going to focus on the main uh, single uh, unpublished statement uh, that uh, comes up. Well, we'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move down two notches here. I'll slow down the pace. But uh, I want to talk to you about the Baker letter, and I want to deal with it uh, effectively here. So let's focus on this letter, and many of you have it in your hands. We gave you the, the, uh, the whole thing, and used the numbering from the White Estate release. And so I want you to notice that. Uh, we have certain paragraphs in a detailed two-page color handout. Um, and I have mine here, too, somewhere. Okay, so... Some of you will have this, and if you're watching this on the live stream, this might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, we're going to try to get these uh, uploads of this to the Burnt Mills Facebook page or somewhere where you could download them. Uh, but we have this we've handed out. It has uh, page 18, paragraph 1 and 2, and page 19, paragraph 1, 2, and 3. Those are the key uh, paragraphs that deal with the humanity of Jesus in the Baker letter. Some of you also have the entire, uh, a copy of the entire Baker letter. And so we gave that to you, and so you can look at it yourself. So we're going to zero in on these in particular, but let's get some background, what background that we can get. And if you have the Baker letter, you'll, um, I can give you some references as we go, so you can look these up by the paragraph number on the, on the left side if you want. I guess I won't, probably won't read them all. Well, what about Baker? Uh, we have this here, and this is what you have as manuscript release 1002. It is the entire Baker letter. So who was William Baker? Baker was a church worker, first in America, then in Australia, then in New Zealand, and finally he came back to America and uh, finished his career in America. In order, what he did was he uh, was involved at first with Adventist printing and publishing. Then he became an evangelist. Then he moved up, uh, moved along, became an administrator, a college Bible teacher. And last, finally, he was a chaplain. Uh, served the church as a chaplain. And from Ellen White's 1895 letter to him, we can infer several things. For example, in paragraphs 
and page 20, page 22, page 23 and 28, I think you can infer from those that he was on the bookish side. He liked to read and study. All right. He was more the reader than the preacher. Paragraph 16, paragraph 17, paragraph 23, paragraph 20, uh, or page rather, these are page numbers, not paragraphs. Uh, page 23, page 28. Those numberings, you'll find that he was more the reader than the preacher. He had personal tendencies toward being melancholy and toward being discouraged. 14.1 is the page and paragraph. And at least in his earlier years, he was more inclined to follow than to lead. And you see that in, on page 17, page 23, and page 28. Things we infer about William Baker from the actual Baker letter itself. that We call that internal evidence. Well, what does the Baker letter say? Ellen White saw that the Bakers, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Baker, they were, dis they were experiencing discouragement and they sought to bring encouragement. He's out there in, in uh, far now from America, down in the South Pacific, and he's trying to work there. It's a difficult work. They're trying to come close to families. And again, William was more versed in press work than in working, uh, trying to work uh, evangelistically directly with people. And so uh, he preferred to study books rather than to argue theology. And so his melancholy nature couple his melancholy nature coupled with the situation he worked in made it a pretty tough and discouraging situation to be in. And so there he was working in Ellen White. God had his, his messenger write up this uh, an extraordinary letter. Uh, if you're a past studying to get into pastoral ministry, the Baker letter has all kinds of useful and important uh, insight for you. There's a lot of insight for us as a pastor or as a church or a Bible worker or anybody, but uh, she writes at to him and sends this to him. I think it's another piece of God's mercy. So Ellen White writes to the Bakers. She feels like they're discouraged and she's going to try to encourage them. So they're trying to come close to the people. A lot of White's letter to Baker prompts him to be more aggressive. Be more aggressive in your personal labor and preaching, she says. She admonishes him also not to devote great time and attention to the writings of the fathers. To, or to questions like speculative questions that the fathers have raised. Traditions of men. She wants him to avoid those things. And do more active, personal, evangelistic labor, she tells him. And she says, depend less on the counsel of distant leaders for how to conduct his work. How long should I stay in a certain area and work, he was writing. And Ellen White says, you know, figure out what you're going to do. Do it. Move on. Keep moving. And he had a tendency to sometimes ask and say, well, how long, how many days should I work in a place and move on? So she's giving him more information. So we focus now on uh, five key paragraphs. And that's on your color, multicolor handout here. All right. So we start on page there where it says 18.1 in the upper left corner. That's, these are the key paragraphs that deal with our topic. Uh, as we look at this, uh, Ellen White is emphatic, and she warns Baker about his teaching concerning the humanity of Christ. And I want you to notice, though, that aside from these sentences of warning, in the main content in these paragraphs, she places emphasis not, her emphasis is not on the humanity, really, of Jesus so as, as much as it's on the deity of Jesus. Ellen White is telling Baker, Jesus is God. And she's making that point over and over again here. So uh, the color, I think there's a color key at the bottom of the page. I won't describe the colors to you. Maybe we didn't put the color key. Yeah, it's at the very bottom on the back, uh, what each thing stands for. So... Uh, there's propensities and all this in here. You can see that. Um, as you look at this, you'll see that we've highlighted uh, uh, yellow highlights his humanity. Uh, green points to his divinity and humanity in combination. Orange has been put there on the phrases concerning propensities. That's 18.1, really. And blue represents an action of the will. Bold print highlights temptation. And this can uh, kind of help you understand what we're looking at there. So now, if you read the Baker, if you read it already, the Baker letter in full, which you probably haven't had time to, but if you do take it home and read it, you'll notice, for example, at 22, 3, page 22, paragraph 3, Mrs. White admonishes Baker not to dwell upon the opinions of the fathers. Their opinions will not help his case, she tells him. This seems to be a reference to a group of writers in their writings called the Early Church Fathers. Now, if you're big on tradition, You'd be very interested in the 37, not page, in the 37 volume set of books reproducing the 16 million words of the fathers. If you're interested in the writings of the fathers, you need to set aside not days, not months, but years to read them. 
Okay, even fast readers have to set aside some time for this. One of the teachings of the fathers is that they debated with each other is called adoptionism. And I believe there was a third handout that you received uh, that gives you some quotations from the early church fathers, early church fathers in adoptionism sample statements. And so there's several statements here uh, about the teachings of the fathers. And one of them is adoptionism. What in the world is that? So the theory of adoptionism comes in, in several different flavors. The basic idea is that Jesus did not begin as God, but merely as a man. He was created. He had a beginning. But because of his exemplary life, he was adopted into the Godhead. Those who taught this claim that there was a time when Jesus did not exist. Jesus was a mere man who became God. Okay. So realize that the main issue in such a, such a teaching inescapably is the when question. So if Jesus was a man and he became God, but he's not actually God, the real question then comes down to what? When did Jesus become God? It's the when question. If you were paying attention as you read Ellen White's letter to Baker, she pleads with him in page 19, uh, paragraph 1, quote, the exact time when humanity blended with divinity is not, it is not necessary for us to know. Now, this doesn't mean there was a time when humanity blended with humanity, with divinity, but that she is telling Baker that this is not a profitable question to dwell upon. Even Arian teaching had an adoptionistic line, making Jesus the first being created, not having existed with the Father through eternity. While Arians will make him to be God, they still, he still always remains to them just some kind of God junior. Let's look at a couple of these. I'll just hit them real quickly here. Near the, um, I'm going to skip the first one, the Shepherd of Hermas. Go down in the middle of the page, uh, near the bottom. But some among the followers of Theodotus, some are disposed to think that never was this man made God. And uh, you can read the whole, the whole one there about the Gnostics and Serenthus and the Ebionites. Down the page toward, toward the bottom, Paul of Samosota. Uh, having been anointed by the Holy Spirit, this is talking about Jesus, he received the title of the anointed. And it goes on another two lines down. He likened, by, by, in fixity and resoluteness of character, he likened himself to God, and having kept himself free from sin, was united with God. And then at the last line there, it says he won the title of Redeemer and, Sa Redeemer and Savior of our race. This is the false, te this is the teaching, or at least the highly confused and erroneous teaching of Paul of, of Samosota. Samosota, I'm not saying it right. The next paragraph uh, example, um, the Savior became holy and just and by struggle and hard work overcame the sins of our forefather. By these means, he succeeded in perfecting himself. And it goes on and, and it talks about how he became... Uh, he became God. Our Savior, uh, uh, third from the bottom in this one on the back page. This is still Paul. Not our, not Bible Paul, this other Paul. It was by virtue of this love that the Savior coalesced with God. And uh, another one. Let's go down to Arius. In the middle of the back of the page, if you have the handout here, it says here, uh, the Logos is not only called Logos conceptually and is not a son of God by nature and in truth, but is merely called son, he too, by adoption as a creature. These are the teachings of adoptionism. Uh, then the next one. Uh, the unbegun made the son as a beginning of things originated and advanced him as a son to himself by adoption. This is, uh, again, Arius. The third one down in Arius on the back. If the father begat the son, he that was begotten had a beginning of existence. And from this it is evident that there was a time when the son was not. There it is. Jesus supposedly, according to this teaching, there was a time when he wasn't God. He didn't exist. But he did so well that God said, I'm going to promote you. I'm going to give you the title, son of God. And you can even be God too. And there's some more quotations here. The next one is interesting uh, near the bottom. I'm going to skip it. All fill us. I'll skip that. You have them. You can look them up. These are some quotations, a sample, a set of sample quotations about the teachings. One of the teachings the early church fathers debated about whether Jesus was created or that he became, uh, he was adopted and became part of deity through adoption. 
Now, if you are reading the writings of the fathers, and if you're thinking about the, the idea that Jesus may have been adopted into the Godhead and Jesus isn't God, but he became God on that, on that basis, Ellen White's statement, it's not, don't try to figure out the time when humanity and divinity blended together in 1901 in her letter to Baker, make a tremendous amount of sense, don't they? Because she's telling him, don't dwell on this. This is problematic. If Baker was dabbling in questions and teachings about adoptionism, Sister White's concerns and the content of her argument fall easily into place. In some versions of adoptionism, Jesus could have sinned in an earlier part of his life before completely overcoming and being adopted into the Godhead. So this was kind of heretical. It was the astute Ralph Larson, and I had his book here, uh, The Word Made Flesh. The Word Was Made Flesh. It was the man that wrote this book who... Uh, noticed this and first proposed this idea that Baker was dabbling with adoptionism and Ellen White is warning him away. Get away from it. It's the wrong thing. And there's actually a, a piece in the back of this book that approaches that and, exp and starts talking about that and, and goes into further detail. If you read some of these adoptionist writings, we looked at some samples, you'll find that the theological errors in that teaching exactly fit the concerns in Ellen White's letter to William Baker. Baker's speculative interest in such ideas would stir up Ellen White's practical soul-winning emphasis. So she writes kindly but firmly in her usual practical way, and she urges him, stop messing with the fathers and get back to work saving souls. And if you're a, a young theology student or a young pastor, and you're dealing with all kinds of challenges and troubles, and, and uh, it, it, sometimes it, it, you kind of want to sit and study rather than dealing with problems head on. It sort of is just a, a piece, and I think that Baker might have had some of that piece going on too. Ellen White says, put your books down, go out and do some evangelistic things. So while she has warnings for Baker concerning claims about the humanity of Jesus, her main emphasis is on, in her writing, Jesus' deity. She says to him over and over again, Jesus is God. He's combined, humanity and divinity are combined in him. And you read what she says in the Baker letter that you have there. Jesus is God. She tells him over and over again about this. She emphasizes repeatedly that Jesus never chose to sin. And again, that is contra, that, it, that would contradict one of the part of the teachings of this adoptionistic teaching, that Jesus could have actually sinned for a while, and then he improved, and then God gave him a promotion. What kind of a promotion is that? So Ellen White emphasizes this, and she will again and again say things like this about Jesus sinning. He never yielded, she uses the term. He never responded. He never stepped on Satan's ground. And Ellen White is just about as emphatic as you could be in the English language. Was Baker entertaining the thought, or God forbid, was he actually even to the point of teaching that Jesus was a mere man who became God? If that's the way it was, then Ellen White's uh, letter to him makes remarkable, even uh, a perfect sense. It really matches that kind of a problem. Ellen White's writing to Baker emphasizing divinity and humanity combined in Jesus and her warning not to try to investigate exactly when this alleged transition of being from not being God to being God, when that happened, it all makes sense. Her emphasis that Jesus never chose to sin is also very logical. But let's turn to another question. What of Ellen White's use of the word propensities? And again, if you have the color, uh, the color the handout with the color page, it's 18.1. It's the first uh, paragraph on the front top of that page. What about this propensities issue? She writes to Baker that Jesus is not to be set before the people as, quote, a man with the propensities of sin. Because of Adam's sin, his descendants, she says, are born with inherent propensities of disobedience. This is all the same paragraph. And Jesus could have sinned, but not for one moment was there in him, and her phrase is, an evil propensity. So let's be careful with this. Propensities, it might sound kind of convoluted or difficult. We just don't usually use that word anymore. It just really means what we would use today, the word tendencies. What kind of tendencies uh, are there? So this is what the word means. Prepositions are very important also here in the phrase propensities of sin, of means from. So did Jesus have anything in him arising from sin? Well, no, for he never sinned. And there could be in him nothing following from, nothing developing from, nothing rooted in personal sin, because in Jesus, how much personal sin was there? Zero. 
So there could not be in him an evil propensity. And she says there wasn't. Jesus had never, had never chosen evil, and thus he had never developed in himself any propensity, any tendency that could be called evil. Jesus never owned any such propensity. He never joined himself to any propensity in his body. He was never mastered by any inherent propensity. Jesus never sinned. Jesus never chose to sin. Jesus never chose to follow the inclination that is in all of us to, to be a re in rebellion. Jesus never followed that inclination. Have you noticed, by the way, that Ellen White compares Adam and Christ in the Baker letter, not once, not once, but twice. For example, in 18 verse 1, Adam is described as pure and as being tempted in Eden. In contrast, Jesus is described as what? Tempted in the wilderness, a very different situation. She further contrasts that Adam chose sin and Jesus did not choose sin. And now when you go to 19.3 in the Baker letter, you'll see on your page, why Ellen White even makes the comparison right there in, again, just a little bit further in paragraph, page 19, paragraph 3. She reminds us that Adam fell, but that Jesus endured under what kind of circumstances? Under the most trying circumstances, Jesus prevailed. That was written, by the way, the Baker letter was written in 1895. Now, just a few years later, what year, who can tell, what year was the book, The Desire of Ages, written? 1898 it is. A few years later, in The Desire of Ages, she writes that, quote, G that Jesus, quote, endured all that it is possible for us to bear, page 123 of your Desire of Ages. She's emphatic. She affirms that Jesus overcame in a damaged nature like we have, and that we also must overcome. You read it in Desire of Ages. Go home and read it right there. Now, the crucial point is that sin is never an inherited state. Tradition may teach that, but the, but the question is, does the Bible teach that, or does Ellen White teach that? And the answer there is, is, is very, not a difficult answer. It is not taught ever in inspired writings. Sin always arises in a personal chosen act. In 18.1, for example, back to your handout, in 18.1 she writes that Adam could fall, and he did fall through transgressing. In 19.1 on your handout, Baker letter, Ellen White is very definite with Baker. She asks that he never leave people with the impression that Jesus, and here's her quote, that Jesus, quote, in any way yielded to corruption. Don't leave even the beginning of that idea with people, she says. Go down to 19 in paragraph 3. There Ellen White highlights Jesus having nothing in him that was attracted to Satan's temptations. She says Jesus would not respond to temptation not, quote, once did Christ step on Satan's ground. By the way, to step is an important action. This is, this is a matter of choice. You take a step. It's a choice you make. To sin is to choose to transgress. First John 3, 4, and all the other passages we looked at. Jesus never chose to transgress. To transgress. And all this makes perfect sense when we just let Mrs. White's writings guide us in the interpretation of her own writings like she suggested we do. And remember, she used the word propensity to mean something that the Christian need not retain. Have you ever heard this quotation? In Review and Herald, April 24, 1900, Ellen White wrote, we need not retain one sinful propensity. And so that means that this is something we don't need to have. We don't need to have it. It's just as plain in her writings as it is. Very plain. Now consider an extraordinary parallel that some may not have before noticed. The Baker letter was written, we said, in the year 1895. The book, The Desire of Ages, went to press in the year 1898. Now when Ellen White's book was released on pages 122 and 123, she seems to have expanded on her previous discussion in this private 1895 letter to William Baker. So I believe it's on your handout on the back side. And I've mingled it, but it's all right. Uh, you'll see the, the parallel here. Ellen White wrote her book. We have it on page 122 and 120, 123. She seems to have expanded on this. So in Desire of Ages, she returns again, as she did in her letter to Baker, to Jesus' struggle with temptation in the wilderness. And just as she quoted and commented on John 14:30 in the 1895 letter, guess what she does in Desire of Ages? She 
1898, in Desire of Ages, she expands on that same text. Another interesting uh, piece of the story here. So what does she say? The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me, John 14, 30. There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin, not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's a very interesting statement from the desire of ages, isn't it? You see, nothing is the wording used. Nothing in Jesus meant nothing in him to respond to sin. She writes that he did not consent to sin. Ellen White is consistent with herself. That's again one of our principles, right? Inspired writer agrees with inspired writer. Readers of the Desire of Ages would not be dabbling with the opinions of the early church fathers. So how much does Ellen White talk about the early church fathers and Desire of Ages? You won't really find her talking about that there. So she didn't really discuss that in that place. She didn't talk about adoptionism, but she did write of Jesus that in him is life original, unbarred, and underived. Desire of Ages, page 520. A clear anti-adoptionist position. You see, if Jesus was a human being and he became God and he wasn't God to begin with, you can't say that in him was life original, unborrowed, and underived. So Ellen White, it goes straight up there and she really uh, takes away any potential that we could ever adopt an adoptionist position. Jesus was not a man that became God. He was God who became man and went back to heaven and is coming back for us, his fellow people. So notice she writes in 1898 after Baker's dallying over the church fathers, that's when she writes this. So we have uh, in Jesus' uh, life, original and borrowed and underived. The desire of ages is, as we said, what? Ellen White's manifesto on the humanity of Jesus. We can safely say that the book, The Desire of Ages, constitutes, constitutes her primary and published teaching on the topic. So think about this. Let's kind of pull a few things here together. Here are all the Bible writings on Jesus' humanity. Then here are all of Ellen White's published writings. Then we have this letter, this one exception, a certain interpretation of the unpublished Baker letter interpreted in the book Questions on Doctrine in, in a way in a favor of, uh, of a Jesus was exempt thesis. Question, is it good interpretation to make so much rely on a speculative basis? Would you take one little verse or a snippet of a verse and build a whole doctrine on top of that? Or would you really start with the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, comparing scripture with scripture, letting the inspired writer help you understand the inspired writer? And isn't that the way to proceed? But if you take one unusual statement and try to build a whole bunch of stuff on top of that, you know, you might turn out in a bad situation with that. Unlike the Baker letter, where we have but little information about the details, we do have the desire of ages. We have the crown jewel of her published writings about Jesus. If we want to know Ellen White's inspired view concerning the humanity of Christ, the Desire of Ages is the clearest, most intentional material available to us on that topic. Like published writings in general, the informational gaps between writer and reader are much smaller because the reader is provided with carefully prepared material. In contrast, the Baker letter was a quickly written private letter and some information that would give us help wasn't needed because Baker knew what she was talking about. Equally inspired, equally inspired, it was written against the backdrop of mutually shared assumptions. The author and the recipient could shortcut with each other just as you shortcut with a friend or a family member when you give a text message. You both know what you're referring, referring to. The Bible and the published writings of Ellen White offer a very clear view of what that Jesus took the nature of Adam after the fall. Are there a few other scattered statements that are a little bit difficult? Yes, there are a few scattered ones, but the main one, the one that's used over and over and over, is this one, which we have taken some time to look at with some depth today. And you have it there in front of you. You have all five key paragraphs out of the Baker letter, plus the whole Baker letter, so you can look for yourself. Some might ask why, why I have spent so much valuable time in this presentation recounting the Bible passages. Why did I go back over again all those Ellen White uh, statements from Desire of Ages? Why didn't I spend more time dealing with propensities and, and fine print and all that? Why didn't I analyze, microanalyze a bunch of stuff? Well, friends, recall our fundamental premise. 
Inspired writings agree with inspired writings. Is this, is this too complicated? Inspired writings agree with inspired writings. Ellen White's writings agree with Ellen White's writings. This is my opinion and my uh, experience that that's the case. I assume it's your case, your, uh, your analysis as well. More clear passages, for the very reason of their clarity, guide us when we're seeking to understand kinds of writing that are less clear to us. Published writings are carefully written so that the author provides very intentionally to the reader the contextual help needed for understanding. Private letters are different. They, too, are a particular genre, a distinct type of writing. The author and the reader can take shortcuts in communication. Readers outside the circle lack some of this information. We can step back. We can look more broadly at the facts. We can see the agreement between the Bible and the other writings of Ellen White and realize that weight of evidence prompts us to reevaluate narrow interpretations which place one set of Ellen White statements in competition with another. In conclusion, in 1957, the promoters of the new theology taught in Questions on Doctrine set forth certain excerpts from a private letter that had lain in the files for 72 years. Then a particular interpretation of White's letter to William Baker was suddenly made determinative for a new way of thinking about the nature of Christ in the church. This was bad hermeneutics. The change could only be accomplished at the cost of ignoring not only the straightforward testimony of Scripture, but also a century of Seventh-day Adventist teaching that Jesus had taken fallen human nature, and it, they also had to ignore some, ra some statements and radically reinterpret other of Ellen White's statements. When we consider the teaching of Adventism on the nature of Christ until the 1950s, when we review Ellen White's published writings on the topic, the answers are clear, a careful reading, of the private Baker letter honoring its place side by side with her published writings shows the Baker letter to be in harmony with the other material. It was not obscurity on Ellen White's part that led to confusion. It was hermeneutical malpractice by the authors of Questions of, on Doctrine. The authors of QOD violated each of the six hermeneutical principles we reviewed. Seventh-day Adventists stand free today to lay aside QODs slanted interpretation of the Baker letter and understand it in a way that lines up easily with the weight of evidence in the Bible and the published writings of Ellen G. White. And I would suggest to you that carefulness and in interpretation helps God's church and demystifies Ellen White's Christology. We can understand the Baker letter and we can do it without harming our brain. It's very easy. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you today for the gift you've given us in all these statements in the Bible, the gift you've given us in the many statements in the writings of Ellen White, and we thank you for the many insights also even in this unpublished writing, the Baker letter. Help us to rightly divide your word, help us to interpret carefully, help us to get on about our Father's work and to be diligent about it. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Why did we spend so much time on this subject? Because this is the single most important passage in all of Ellen White's writings, which changed our view from the first hundred years of Seventh-day Adventist understanding of Jesus our Savior to the new view which has virtually destroyed his effectiveness in preparing a people for the last generation. This passage. So that's why we spent some time on it. You need to know, you need to think about it for yourself, you need to be prepared for what you will hear immediately, if you haven't heard it many times already, this proves that, they say, this proves that Jesus Christ couldn't inherit our fallen nature. All right, you've been listening to some heavy duty stuff today. If you're really kind of tired of uh, propensities and original sin and all kinds of words that, I, that we've been throwing at you, you're receiving right now a little sermon presentation that Elder Kirkpatrick has presented, which does this work in a very simple, easy to understand way. It's not like the last one. When I first read it, he gave it to me a few months ago, I said, the folks that are coming to our next meeting need to have this to take home. So this one is much more easy to understand. It is simple, but it is very clear as to what is really the issue with last generation. So we're placing that in your hand right now as one more of those gifts. We want you in this meeting to be able to take home with you some things to study for yourselves. Don't just listen to us. 
please don't do that. You need to study this carefully for yourself. We could be wrong just as any other preacher and teacher in the Adventist church can be wrong. And you need to know, make up your own mind as to what is truth and what is error because you can never say, I heard pastor say this. That will not be an adequate defense either in the judgment or before a court of law. You need to have this information on your own. We want you to have it.